Um, as we begin this morning, I just want to make a note. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of the people who helped us with our Good Friday service. Uh, Reverend Mark spearheaded that for us this year. I'm so grateful to him and Reverend Nadine, uh, our practitioners, our ministerial students. Thank you all. I am so grateful to you. So here we are, Easter Sunday, 2021. Hard to believe. Um, all right, so I do. I have an Easter story, a little Easter story. So there's uh, a man who's walking down the street, and it so happens uh, that he sees uh, a rabbit uh, running, hopping across the road. And unfortunately, the rabbit gets hit. And the man is just horrified, horrified, horrified. And, and, and he's standing over there looking at the rabbit, thinking, oh my god, what do I do, what do I do? And this woman's walking by, and she says, do you need any help? And he says, well, I, I don't know. He says, I, I just was watching this rabbit. It ran across the street. It got hit by a car. And she reaches into her purse, and she pulls out a can, and she sprays it on the rabbit, and the rabbit hops up, looks around, and jumps across the road, just hops completely across the road like nothing ever happened. And the man says to the woman, that was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. What did you put on the rabbit? And she said, well, this is, this is just hairspray. He went, hairspray? And she says, yeah, it says right here, restores life to dead hairs. <laughs> right. My Easter joke. I'm sorry, you know. Look, you ask for jokes, this is what you get. I'm sorry. Uh, so we started talking last week, and, and it's really this, the theme of the whole season that, last, uh, that the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. You know, I got to tell you, I'm embarrassed to say this at my age, but you know, when, as, as I was uh, coming into New Thought and metaphysical teaching, I was fascinated. I mean, I really was. I did not realize that Jesus was Jewish. I thought he was Catholic. You know, I mean, I really did. It, so this was, this was a revelation to me. Um, anyway, so, you know, there is truth that shows up, spiritual truth shows up in all traditions around the world. Uh, at least some aspect, some component of spiritual truth shows up in all traditions around the world. I think that God is so big that no one path, no one religion could possibly have a monopoly on the infinite. Right? So, and I say also that there are so many paths to God because God is the only place to go. And eventually, we all find our path. So it is um, my goal for all of us that we use the science of mind in a real and practical way. And I think this is what Ernest Holmes intended when he created this philosophy. It should make our life better. Because you participate in the science of mind, your life should be better, or at least provide you with tools that could help make your life better. You know, there are universal themes that show up in different spiritual traditions around the world. Uh, you know, most religions say similar things about faith, about love, about good works, about brotherhood, about forgiveness. And Ernest Holmes um, kind of focused on these universal themes, and he took from all these different philosophies and traditions and kind of twisted these themes together. And that's where the science of mind comes from. He didn't have, he says he didn't have any original uh, idea. It was that he took the ideas that were out there that he felt uh, are what we could really get a hold of and we could improve our experience of life. We could grow spiritually by harnessing these universal themes. So now Easter. Well, for, you know, here we are, and people ask me again and again, well, do you think it happened? Do you think it really happened? Did it happen the way the Bible says? And my take on this, like so many things spiritual, is just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it isn't true. You know? And, and so there's something for us to wrap our head around a little bit. Metaphysically, we believe, I certainly believe, that all that takes place in the Bible is actually happening in us, in our journey back to God. You know? So the story, the story doesn't change. We visit the same stories every year, but what's different is we are different. Our consciousness has evolved. Our life is in a different place. So whether I look at the Christmas story or the Passover story or the Easter story, whatever I may be looking at, the thing is that now I'm in a different place. My consciousness has evolved from the last time I looked at this story and held my life up to it. In Science of Mind, our prayer is always, always that our consciousness is what changes, that our thinking is what changes. I mean, because face it, after all the praying we have done for other people to be different, and God knows we want them to be different, um, 
It has not worked so well, has it, if we tell the truth, right? So all I can change is me. All I can change is my thinking, my consciousness, change me from the inside out. So if we, if we receive the message of, of the story of the season, I believe that if we can really receive that message, if we can take it in, we will be transformed because it informs us at a very, very deep level. So I'll start with this about Pharaoh again, in case you missed a little bit last week, that Pharaoh enslaves all of us just like the Pharaoh enslaved the Hebrew people. Do you not feel enslaved after over a year of COVID? I certainly do. I certainly do. So I can only imagine that if I feel enslaved with COVID, how the children of Israel felt enslaved by the Pharaoh. So an astrologer says to the Pharaoh, look, a child's going to be born and he's going to overthrow you. And so the Pharaoh decides, okay, we're going to toss all the newborns into the Nile. What a guy! Whoever says such like that? Hey, let's take all the babies and we'll throw them in the Nile. I mean, what a charmer he was. Now Moses' mother comes up with a plan to hopefully save her little baby. She makes a basket of reeds and she covers it with pitch so that it won't sink. And she puts the baby Moses in the basket and hides him in the bulrushes of the river. And the princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, finds the baby. And Moses' mother is smart. She's hanging around like, hey, do you need a wet nurse for the baby? I could do that for you. And so the princess takes Moses and the mother uh, into uh, the royal life. Now, Moses himself and his journey, he was able to escape the slavery that his people experienced. He's raised in a palace, not unlike the Buddha, who was raised in a palace away from all the unpleasantness of life. The interesting thing is that his heart led him to recognize the suffering of his people, just like the Buddha, just like the Buddha. There are so many parallels. So what happens is Moses sees a slave, and the slave master is beating the slave. Of course, the slave is a Hebrew person, and Moses kills the slave master. Now he's got to run. And so he runs away, and eventually he gets married, and he becomes a shepherd, and this leads him to an encounter with the burning bush. And the bush burns but is not consumed. And this is important because the bush says to Moses, you have got to help my people. Of course, the bush is the voice of God. Help my people. Now, Moses does what I think any of us would do when given an extraordinary task like that. We do this. God says, I pick you. And we go, who, me? Are you sure, me? Don't you mean somebody else? You're, surely you're thinking of somebody else. And Moses comes up with all these reasons why he cannot do it, and God rebukes Moses, saying, do not doubt God. So here's something. When God gives us something to do, we are not supposed to question or doubt God. When we know it's ours to do, we are just supposed to do it. I tell you, in my own life, this happens to me so, so often that an intuition will come to me, and if I follow it right away, I'm so convinced, I always say, God, I'm so glad I listened to that intuition. I'm so glad I followed that thought. I'm so glad I did that. And when I don't, the opposite happens. I would say, why didn't I listen to that? Why didn't I listen to that? <sighs> so Moses thinks he doesn't have what it takes. And I have certainly been in that place where I thought, no, nah, this is too big for me. I don't think I have what it takes. But ours is not to doubt God. God will compensate for our seeming weaknesses. So like Moses says to God, he says, but I can't speak to the people. I stutter. Imagine asking somebody who has a big stuttering problem to now become the public speaker. And God says, don't worry about it. I'm going to have your brother Aaron do the speaking for you. And God will send Moses all the power he needs. And how this is going to happen, this is really interesting, is it's going to be in the form of a staff. You know, so Moses picks up a snake, it turns into a staff, and, and, that, and that staff, I would say for us metaphysically, is like our word. Right? So miracles, healings, are born from our conviction. When we have some hope, belief, faith, it becomes conviction, and that's when a healing can happen. So evil, hate, the bad stuff in life is also born of conviction if we tell the truth. You know, a piece of the story that really strikes me at this time is that God tells Moses to hold the staff high, right? And so Moses is holding the staff high, and when he's holding the staff high, the Israelites do really well in battle, right? But then it gets really heavy. I mean, think about that. It gets really heavy over time. He's holding this big staff up over his head, and he starts to drop. And then when it starts to drop, the Israelites begin to become defeated, 
right? And so two people help him, Aaron, his brother, and someone else. They help him, and, it, and, and what this does, <sighs> this shows me how we so often want to do it ourselves, but the truth is we're in this together and we need support from other people. We need to allow other people in, right? And so Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, there are so many forms of slavery today, you know, and if we could just look at our own life and say, gee, where am I enslaved? Where do I feel enslaved? Where do I feel that some power outside of me has control over me, something? You know, so um, these plagues ensued. We talked about that last week. And the last plague, the final plague, is what we think of as the Paschal Lamb. And this is a theme from the Old Testament that will be carried into the New Testament, where they put the blood, the blood of the lamb on the door, uh, on the, around the door, and that they would, um, God would pass over those houses, the plague would pass over those houses, and the firstborn would not die. So Pharaoh finally lets the people go. This was, this was a deal changer, this one. And so I love how the Israelites don't want to go with Moses. That, to me, is just incredible. They've been enslaved, right? But, but you know, would they have just like said, oh, great, Moses, 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 who are you? You know? And second of all, and where are you taking us? Oh, into the desert? Great. Are there hotels? Are there restaurants? You know, will we be able to buy new shoes along the way? These are things I would want to know, right? You know? So we're told again and again that we have to trust God. So humanly, though, when I hear that, I want to figure out how I've got to trust God. You know, I want to know how God's going to do God's part. Then I'll be able to trust God. Ah, the level of faith Moses had to have for the Red Sea to part. And so this is what I want to ask us. So here we are in a time where there is mass crucifixion. What's the level of faith we need to have to part our Red Sea? You know, what level of faith, what level of spiritual practice, what do I need to know in consciousness so that what it is that's in front of me that seems insurmountable is nothing to God? Because, you know, in the mind of God, God doesn't know big and small, right? God doesn't say, wow, this is going to be really hard. You want me to get all those people across the Red Sea? I, I just don't have time to build a bridge. I don't know how to do it. You know, Moses, Moses is an interesting character to me because Moses didn't actually make it to the promised land. You know, Joshua, who was born in the desert, led the people into the promised land. And I thought about that so much, and I think it's because the people who were with Moses from the beginning, they had this history of enslavement. You know, they had a story. And that story is what holds us back so often, isn't it? But Joshua had been born in the desert while the Hebrew people were traveling. And so he didn't know anything about slavery. That was just a story Joshua's parents told. You know? Uh, he had no memory of those conditions. Now, you know, people often say, I have heard in the world, and people have certainly said to me, oh, do you believe in Jesus? Is Jesus your savior? And in science of mind, the only thing we need saving from is from our own thinking, right? Because I know my thinking can take me straight to heaven and my thinking can also create a hell in my life. I suspect if that's true for me, it's probably true for you. But now in the Old Testament, no matter what the problem, God has an answer. God sends a person. Well now, you know, for people who follow the Easter story, Jesus was a Jew. And the Last Supper was the Passover Seder. I didn't get to go to a Passover Seder this year. I really missed that, you know, uh, because I'm, I want to experience all of it. In New Thought, we see Jesus as the great example of what we may become. Now, I realize a lot of other traditions perhaps see Jesus as the exception to the rule. But for us, in Science of Mind, what the New Thought founders realized is Jesus shows us what is potential within us. He demonstrates, you know, that the craziness of the world can often result in crucifixion, but don't be so focused on the crucifixion that we miss the resurrection, right? So we could look at the crucifixions we experience in our life right now and say, 
okay, this is actually good news. I don't like being crucified, but I know there will be a resurrection if I give my full attention on a regular basis to God. See, and that's what we are promised, that if we will focus on God, everything else will be added. See, because the true self of each of us is birthless, the true self of us is deathless, and Jesus knew his oneness with God. Now, we have moments of that. I think we all have moments where we know that we are connected with something greater. But not only did Jesus know that, he expressed that oneness with an energy of unconditional love. Now, I have stabs at that. I try, you know, and sometimes that love goes out there, and sometimes it doesn't come up as well as I'd hoped for it to, you know? Uh, so it just shows me I have more work to do. Um, I think it's also interesting to think of Jesus being crucified on Golgotha. It says in the Bible that there was a thief to the right and a thief to the left, and they were also crucified. Now, I think those thieves to the right and left metaphysically represent the past and the future because they can steal so much of our present from us. We sort of go on this little day trip back to the past, and we rehash, and we go over, and we remind ourselves why we shouldn't forgive, and why we don't like this one and that one. And then we go on a little day trip into the future, and we imagine this, and they're going to say this, and I'll say that, and I'll slam the door, and I'll storm out of the house, and we make all that stuff up. So we can see that Jesus, in the present moment, gets to resurrect. When enough of us are lifted in consciousness, you know, I believe that we can do the great things too. You know, God made all of us. You know, when Jesus was placed in the tomb, after three days, and I think that period of time is essential, the women come to the tomb to um, anoint the body. And there's an angel there, and the angel says, he's not here, he's risen, right? And so I think, Honestly, we have to make a decision to be resurrected from the conditions we find ourselves in. We have to make that decision. Honestly, because if we don't, if we don't, how is the law, how is the universe, how is spirit going to support us in lifting up above a particular condition? You know, uh, and part of this, I got to say, I think we have to become just tired of of our own story, of our own condition, of our own problem. You know, when we get tired of it enough, we'll do something about it. You know, Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How? How did he overcome the world? I read that and I go, how? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do we do it? How do you do it? How? With God, of course. Notice in history where we need, I mean, I, I look at history and I think never has there been a time where we have to consider the survival of the entire planet like we do today. I think as a race, we act, as the human race lives with crucifixion all the time. But consider this, there is another way. We do not have to live with the crucifixion we experience. We will be back to a new normal sometime in the future, right? I don't know when exactly, but things seem to be moving along at a pretty quick pace right now. That makes me very hopeful. How will we be in the new normal? How, how will we be different than we have been? I don't want to take my stinky COVID consciousness into the new experience of life when all of this is over. I don't want to take being slothful and lazy and procrastinating or whatever my worst tendencies may have been during COVID. I want to leave all of those behind. I want to leave that in the tomb and be completely resurrected. See. Moses hoped, and then he acted. And see, hope is important because for all of us, hope is the beginning of faith. Hope are those tiny mustard seeds that we are praying like crazy are going to turn into something. Jesus hoped and acted. So no matter what we go through, I believe that healing is possible for us. You know, the risen Christ, we believe, was healed and whole in every way. And I wonder if we see ourselves that way, or do we continue to see ourselves as broken or damaged or defective? No matter what, God created you as love. No matter what, God created you as loving and everybody else too. So my Easter message this year is this, to love God with your whole heart. And I believe out of loving God with your whole heart, that's the consciousness that lifts us above conditions and heals our life. Let's pray.
So we turn our attention inward now for a moment, recognizing that right where we are, the fullness, the allness of God, God's infinite loving spirit is right here. It's the truth about us. We are emanations of the Most High God. And in this awareness of our connection with infinite, loving, intelligent spirit, I speak the word for each and every one of us. And where there is crucifixion in our life, I claim for us that we experience a personal resurrection. We make a decision right now to be resurrected from the conditions of our past. We're not caught up in what's gone on in the past or wasting time thinking too much about the future. In this present moment, we are each a place where the light and love of God is revealed like no place else. So we include in our prayer today our family members, our parents and children, loved ones, all of those we hold near and dear. And we know that right where they are, God is present that they are surrounded and filled with God's light and love, and a mantle of God's peace surrounds and sustains them all of their days. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in, where there is the appearance of so much chaos, so much crucifixion. We claim that with God, all things are possible. And so whatever comes to mind today, we claim healing right there in our world, whether it's in our hometown, our home, our country, or the world that we live in. We know healing is possible and we call it forth from the infinite mind that we all live and move and have our being in. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is a raising up in consciousness for us and we are setting firm in consciousness new conditions for our future. I know that the path ahead for each and every one of us is filled with light, not dark, and that we are blessed beyond measure. So with a full heart, I say, thank you, God. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. I am so blessed. I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much. I am so